I'll introduce you before you speak. Mm -mm. <laughs> hey, lots of smiles. This is nice. Smiley, smiley faces coming in. Ah, we've got four screens of people. Oh, little one. Who's that? Olga, Alaska, and a little girl. Hey. Oh. We've also got Johnny Walker. Johnny Walker? Honestly. <laughs> John Walker. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. <laughs> You're not meant to know what that means, are you? Oh, come on. <laughs> I've been around. Oh, <laughs> Helen. Helen's here. Sue's here. Look, there's Sue. Sue Doo. I haven't called you Sue Doo in a while, Sue. I hope this is not recording yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it is. Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. It's fine. <laughs> oh, monastics have no airs and graces. Oh, Diane Randall. Oh, Diane's here. That's nice. Yeah. So we're just having a look, checking you all out as you're checking us out. Yeah. <laughs> Eric's here. Remember Eric, who came to spend the rains at Jana Grove? Oh, yeah. Eric from California. Ah, oh, nice. Eric comes to all my stuff. <clears throat> So yeah, we're starting a little bit later because a lot of people didn't show up. So I had to send uh, things to the wait list, send confirmations to the people on the wait list. And we're not quite sure if we can get the live stream working or not at this point, but uh, it will be recorded. And just to go through a couple of uh, practical things at the beginning. Um, so all the questions we're going to take will be from the chat box. So we would like to ask you to use the chat box only to put your questions in. You can put the questions to everyone um, and I will receive those questions. My co-host will um, send me those questions on an email so it's easier for me to find them and I will read them out from there. And you have the option to either have me read the question out or to ask the question yourself. But if you ask the question yourself, you will be videoed, okay? because it's going to be, we're gonna have the settings on speak of you. So that means that whoever speaks will be caught on camera live, which shouldn't be too scary because as you know, we're all human beings. <laughs> we're all a little bit quirky, so that's okay. But if you don't want that to happen, I can read it out for you. So before you write your question, please put the word me in capital letters if you want to ask the question and please put the word VC that's Venerable Chanda, if you want me to ask the question, okay? So before your question, me in capital letters or VC, right? Is that sort of clear? So if you're going to ask the question, one of our co-hosts will unmute you. Uh, you'll get a little message and you just press it and you'll unmute yourself, I think, and then you can speak out. Uh, I think... That's the only introductory announcement we have. And I think since we're already a little bit late, we'll get right on. And I will introduce my wonderful teacher who is the world teacher really, or at least a, a quite a large percentage of the world. I think your most popular talk, Adrian Brown, had about 2 million views on YouTube and certainly oh, millions of downloads every year from the BSC. That's about so the talk about letting go. That's right. I just sent that. I just sent that to Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Ask him to let go. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Well, <laughs> setting the tone. <laughs> so I do have a little uh, biography to read out, which I sort of compiled on our new leaflet, a new camper leaflet. So I'll read that out because last time um, Ajahn Brahm asked me to introduce him as Ajahn Donut which I very dutifully did. And um, some people didn't quite like that because they thought it showed disrespect. Anyway, so I'm going to read out, <laughs> Ajahn Brown will say something about that, but I'm going to read out the official one, which I also put together. So Ajahn Brown is a renowned and beloved meditation master and the author of many best-selling books. Trained in Thailand with Ajahn Chah, he's been a monk for over 45 years. 
Ajahn Brahm is spiritual director of the Buddhist Society of Western Australia and advisor to numerous Buddhist groups, including Anukampa Bhikkhuni Project, Yay. which is a, a project in England to try and establish the first Bhikkhuni monastery in the UK. He courageously pioneered the revival of Bhikkhuni ordination in the Theravada tradition and is passionate about creating opportunities for all people to experience the liberating power of the Buddha's teachings. Despite huge responsibilities, Ajahn teaches tirelessly and his humorous, in insightful talks save lives. So, so I think the structure of the day is that uh, we'll start with maybe just a very brief little Dhamma reflection or welcome from Ajahn Brahm. And then we'll start to take questions. So if you do have them, please start putting them in the chat box. And it's one per person, okay? Because we don't have time for 83 uh questions times two or three so and then i think about halfway through ajan which we didn't tell you about halfway yeah. through say at one o'clock we'll have about a 10 minute meditation just to restore another... oh sorry no, yeah that's 45 minutes, minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay yeah sure okay so Excellent. take it away ajan okay well first of all that it's so easy to hear many 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 talks online and there's so many great talks old talks but the one thing which the buddha always encouraged was to have the discussion which is basically the question and answers and i uh, enjoy that as well simply because some of the questions put me on the spot which is wonderful to be able to do that it means that you become a sharper teacher when people challenge some of the ways you say things or because they maybe misunderstand those things and it's the same way, it's respectful to have that uh, friendly just asking deep questions. Uh, I've seen many, many times in many other monasteries that sometimes somebody asks a very, very good question and the teacher just gives a stupid answer and the student just walks away. They miss the great opportunity of taking the, the meaning of this Dhamma deeper. So, you know, with respect, like anything else, it comes from the heart. It's, where you're coming from is more important than what you say and what you do. And sometimes people mistake that. So please be very, feel very free to ask the toughest of questions, the most difficult of questions. The answer may not satisfy you, but then answers don't usually satisfy. They lead to more understanding and it's the deeper understanding which satisfies you eventually. So hopefully you have a wonderful, uh, was it morning, afternoon, evening, whatever it is, and ask whatever question you feel appropriate. So that's Ajahn Brahm. I don't want to waste too much time, so let's hit the question button. All right, so I've got two questions that have come through to me. <clears throat> uh, so one, is it necessary to be a vegan to progress on the path? And what is the benefit of not eating afternoon? Okay, it's not necessary to be a vegan. It's not so much what you eat, but why you eat it. And is there a lot of greed there, a lot of desire there? Or why are you eating food? And what does it do to you afterwards? Now, does it create health in you? Does it just create craving for more food? Sometimes you do find that some food is just so delicious that sometimes you just can't stop. And sometimes the food may be just so pure but for you, it doesn't uh, meet your uh, requirements you know, of as a body. We are all conditioned beings. And sometimes that conditioning means we have to eat this or we have to eat that. I still remember the story I read when I was a, a student and it really made a big impression on me of a little kid. When it was born, it couldn't speak yet, but would crawl all over the kitchen looking for salt and would you know, eat salt and put it in his mouth and his mother thought that's very unhealthy and so hid all the salt in the kitchen and of course what happened next was the the kid got more and more sick and eventually the child died and only after the death the doctors did an autopsy and found it had this incredibly rare condition that that child required you know, un unusual amounts of salt to keep alive as if the kid knew what it needed. It wasn't craving, it was just the need of the body expressed in the desires of the tongue. 
And so I took a lot of, um, a lot of uh, insight from that story because sometimes what do you eat? Why do you eat it? Sometimes it's not out of craving. Sometimes it's out of survival. And eating in the afternoon, if you can not eat in the afternoon, what happens is the food goes in your tummy uh, just before noon and you get lots of energy from that. And soon the tummy learns that it's not going to get anything in the afternoon or evening. There's plenty stored in the body. And it means that in the afternoon or evening, even if you're healthy, you can have a lot of time to meditate without any interruptions about looking for food. Food is easy to eat, very difficult to cook and to clean up afterwards. That's why to, if you can do it one go or two goes, you know, I found that just such a, such a saving of time, if you could do that. Thank you, Ajahn. Um, the next question is how to deal with rejection. How to deal with rejection. But sometimes, why did you want that person or want that job or wanting that be a member of that sort of society? Sometimes it's not rejection, it's just one type of wanting. And sometimes if I'm rejected, yay, there's a sense of freedom <laughs> when you're rejected. I still remember when I was nine, 19, that's right, yeah, when oh, I was 20, when my girlfriend rejected me quite a long relationship and she dumped me and at the time I felt so much more freedom you're free to go and do whatever you want now I'm not sure I always saw the positive side of rejection so many other people you uh and who care about you so don't take rejection to be a personal fault you can always look at rejection as an opportunity to have a bit more peace and calm in your life Okay. But not a personal fault. There's nothing wrong with you. I got rejected. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with me. Is there? <laughs> no. Okay, lovely. So now um, someone's asking for a meditation story. Would you please tell the story about the donkey and the carrot? Oh, the donkey and the carrot. Once upon a time, there was an ass. Is that right? <laughs> donkey. No, no, a donkey. And the, how do donkeys catch carrots? Very quickly, if you run after the carrot as a donkey, you never catch, oh, sorry, of course you will. I started the story in the wrong place. So I'll start off again. <laughs> uh, it's a bit late for me. So once upon a time, there was a donkey and they tried to make the donkey pull the cart. The donkey was too lazy to pull the cart. So the owner got a stick out and tried to beat the donkey. And of course, the donkey still doesn't move. So instead of using a stick to beat the donkey, the owner tied a stick to the donkey's neck. So the front of the stick was two foot in front of the donkey's head. On the end of the stick, they put a string. On the end of the string, they put a carrot. So the carrot and the donkey were two foot apart. The carrot saw the, sorry, not the carrot, saw the donkey. The donkey saw the carrot and the donkey ran after the carrot. But it doesn't matter how fast a donkey runs after the carrot, the carrot is still two foot in front of the donkey. But the donkey, the donkey happened to pass by uh, June Street in Oxford, where uh, Venerable Chanda was giving a little talk. And the donkey heard the story of how to catch the carrot. And it's just so easy. The donkey had been running after that carrot, but now the donkey stops. And when the donkey stops, stops running after things. What happens to the carrot? It goes further away. It swings more and more away from the, the donkey. But then the carrot starts swinging to the donkey. And as it stays, goes to the donkey, but soon the carrot is at the place where it usually belongs, two foot in front of the donkey's mouth. And now it's coming at top speed towards the donkey's mouth. And soon, as it swings upwards and closer to the donkey's mouth, it gets so close to the donkey's mouth, all the donkey needs to remember is like kindness. And to me, that is the donkey thinking, carrot, the door of my mouth is open to you, come in. And that way the donkey catches the carrot. In the same way in meditation, if you chase after states of experience, you'll find that they always in front of you, but they never, you can never reach them. They're always too far away. 
almost you can see them, you can smell them, taste them, but you can't capture them. And what you do next is you have a bit of confidence in the teachings of the Buddha. You let go, you stop chasing. Stay in this moment, forget about the future. And then you experience that the carrot goes further away from you. The deep meditations seem to go further away. But soon if you wait, have patience, those deep meditations start coming towards you. They come closer and closer to you. And as they come closer and closer, they, you don't do anything. You just have this beautiful kindness, this letting go, letting things be. And they come right into you. Only when you stop chasing them. How Ajahn Chah would describe that was the mango orchards. And the only way to, cap, to get one of those delicious mangoes, you can't get them by climbing the tree, by throwing sticks up at the mango tree or getting a ladder or a cherry picker or a helicopter or blowing the mango trees up. The only way you can get a mango from these amazing mango trees planted by the Buddha is to sit perfectly still under the mango tree. Open your hand and let the mango fall into it. To be still and to be kind. That is the path of deep meditation. Okay, lovely. So we're getting lots of questions now. So we'll do I'll our best be to answer everyone's you. questions, but um, yeah. we might not get to everybody. So please do forgive us if we don't get to yours. Um, so the next question is, whenever things go wrong, I feel it's my fault and I have to fix it. And if I don't, people will think badly of me. How do I let go, please? No matter what you do in this world, people will always think badly of you. And some people will think wonderfully of you. So don't ever aim at getting everybody to think well of you. you now, I've got many people who just, just don't like me and thought I would do a terrible, terrible thing by ordaining bikunis. There's people who just sometimes get embarrassed, you know, even hearing my name. Am I concerned about that? Of course not. Because you don't live trying to please others. You don't try and live trying to get uh, people's um, praise. Even the Buddha had many people who blamed him, who didn't like him. So instead of trying to uh, live up to other people's expectations, instead just be free of that. And just you feel in yourself what is a good thing to do, what is the appropriate thing to do. Because you know, other people only see them a few hours a day or probably even less. But you, you have to live with yourself 24 seven for the rest of your life and you know, after life as well. It's one of the reasons why it's your relationship to yourself, how you feel about yourself, what you did, why you did it. That is much more important. If you do make a mistake, you don't sort of punish yourself, you forgive yourself. Forgiving yourself creates greater sense of honesty. You don't hide things when you can forgive. And you learn. You don't expect to be perfect. And of course, you know, I'm not perfect in the sense I make mistakes. But nevertheless, I learn. Every time I make a mistake, I learn. Try not to make the same mistake again. So that's why, you know, when you do, are you not perfect? Celebrate that you're a human being. And this is where you're learning and growing. Great. So the next couple of questions people would like to ask themselves. Um, so okay. bearing in mind that they will be um, on the video. If you want to change your mind, yeah. that's fine. Um, but we'd like to invite Grace to ask. Grace Hammond, if you'd like to unmute. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can. Yes. Uh, John, thank you so much. Um, this is just a wonderful opportunity for me. Um, I am in the US and it's all feeling very heartbreaking right now. Um, and I just wanted some advice on how to, how to help. I want my kids to grow up in a world I'm proud of. Okay. Thank you. First, first of all, just being a good mom makes them very proud to be in this world. And it's also to teach the kids you know, to be realistic. There are some wonderful people in this world. There's still some incredible people in this world. 
especially in the United States. And, but there's also some crazy people in this world as well. And when the children, your children, have the opportunity to see both, then they can take their choice what sort of person they want to be in this world. And I don't think that it's because that I'm a monk, but I have traveled around a lot, seen a lot of people, and there's more good people in this world than there's bad people in this world. And sometimes you see the good people in the most unexpected places, like even some prisons which I've visited, you know, on the streets. As a monk, whenever you go on arms round, you get much more uh, gifts from the poor people. And in the end, you don't judge you know, the United States by a couple of people who go on the news and say stupid, stupid things. The United States is much bigger than that. The world is much bigger than that. So don't judge it by the loud mouths and the ones who do terrible, terrible things, because that's what the news wants to actually to, to put on the, the, the front pages of the newspapers. The crazy people get attention. The good people, they're the ones, you know, just walking down the street every day. And the people you meet in the shops. So please. When you meet those people, just smile at them and say, what a wonderful thing it is you're in my community, in my neighborhood. I really appreciate you. And then they think, well, what a wonderful woman this is. And that's how you teach your kids. The old two bad bricks in the wall story, which I'm sure all of you know, I wanted to destroy a wall because all I could see was two bad bricks until somebody told me there's 998 good bricks in that wall as well. When I saw that, I realized, yeah, that's a pretty good wall, which I, which I made. The same with the United States, there's so many good people in that United States. And don't just judge you know, your life, the current times, by a few loud mouths who get all the attention, while the good people, they just walk quietly by. So uh, the next question is from Eric, and I think Eric would like to ask this question himself. So if you can unmute yourself, Eric. And... Hi, Jajan <coughs> and Kuni. Hi. Uh, I'm just going to, uh, I'm not going to read it, but I'm just going to say it off, off the cuff here. Um, I've been dealing with a lot of overwhelming stress and anxiety and depression. Um, and uh, it's been too long. It's been eight months of this, and I my meditations are awful. I'm not able to rest. I'm not able to get through things. Um, there's so many mitigating factors right now. Be it, I have no job. I have no income. I have no financial aid coming in. I'm on the brink of being homeless in two months. Um, there is no release. And um, to top it off, I went through a massive heartbreak uh, breakup with a relationship. Uh -huh. And as yeah. you know, I know you're of the mindset that you're free, but I, I don't, I do not feel free. I feel very much attached. There was a daughter involved with this little girl, oh, five yeah, yeah. girl and the woman that I was with. And I'm, I'm absolutely miserable. And, and I'm, I'm, yeah. I don't want to be this. I don't want to hold on to it. But at the same time, it was so, so deep for me. And it was it yeah. moved my house inside me. And uh, yeah. just, where are you I'm, staying now? I'm in, where are you uh, staying? In LA, now, I have an apartment here. Yeah, apartment in LA. Hopefully, there may be sort of someone in LA, maybe even listening to this, or some friend, who can just, you know, just realize this is a great opportunity to be of service, to be able to help, just financially, because they have an accumulation of problems. And there's so many to think about, so many to deal with, that just gets unbearable. And just little practical things like at least being able to pay the rent and get some food. That gives you a little time. And as you get the little time, it's the old story which you know the Buddha would always talk and my teacher would always talk that these things they do change, they do pass. And it's just to keep you just a little bit of kindness in your situation just goes so far. And there's just one person, one kind person that comes to the door and knocks and say, are you okay? Anything I could do to help? And if they can help you, and they do help you, then in the future, you, know, you are what we call in debt to them. But you don't pay them back later on when you are stronger, 
and you know got a bit more energy you go and pay that back to others it's paying it forward it's actually how Ajahn Chah would taught me if I can if I help if he helped me I could never say thank you to Ajahn Chah he said go out there and help somebody else when I've helped somebody else and I paid off my debt your debt to me is later on is to go and help somebody else now when they're in the difficulty you're in now sometimes you difficult to understand why is this happening to me what's the reason for it and the reason for it is that you know we learn from these experiences when you're right in the depth of them you can't realize their purpose but later on when it does pass you learn so much about what it feels like what it really is like you know to be in such a situation and then to be able to help others is something which has become so natural to you this is actually where we learn. One of the meaning of suffering is so that we can learn what it's like and to give compassion later on to somebody else who's in the same situation as you're in right now. There's a purpose to what you're experiencing. You can't see it yet, but you know, you know me and you can trust me that later on you'll find this was such a great experience, teaching experience for you. To have to go through this survive so you can help so many others who are in the same place that you're in now they won't last things do change there are some very kind people out there you just got in the middle of a big mess and you know the story that if you really somebody is dumped truckload upon truckload of dog shit in front of your house or you're in your apartment your job now is to, it takes a long time, but the only thing you can do is to dig in into the garden and grow some beautiful flowers and fruit trees. And you find it does happen that way. You become, you survive, and you become a wonderful person as a result. So the bigger picture gives you some hope and purpose, some meaning to what you have to go through. And later on, you kid, you know, is it just one child or two or three? How many? One, okay. That one child. You know, it's the daddy. He can't separate you. You may try, but it can't be done. And that child will come and see his daddy. And, you know, it's one of those things you're just waiting for and waiting for and waiting for. It has to happen. And then all the sort of the tears of joy of uniting a child with their dad. It will come from your child, will we'll make that happen. It happens actually sooner than you think. So as I say, just you hang in there, knowing that this is the nature of our world, <clears throat> and you find that you learn so much from it. Okay. Okay, okay. so ah, the next one also would like to ask, uh, themselves. So Paul Sharp has a question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. All right. Sorry, I can't. I'm just gonna. I can't see you. <laughs> All right. I can see you. Yeah. Right. <laughs> oh, I can see you now. Um, yeah. So I had a question about. So if you're born into the human realm. Yes. Um, you get associated with a particular body. Yeah. And so they're definitely that. So that association seems to work in two directions. So if I cut my finger, then I feel the pain. You don't feel the pain. Yeah. And if I think about raising my hand, then it's my hand that goes up and, and not yours. So there's an association with a particular body there. So if, yes. in, the, in the jhanas, is that? Is that association temporarily broken between? Yes. Yeah. So when you actually, you know, within a jhana, you, you can't experience your, your body at all. And that connection to it is gone. You can't do anything to your body. Your body is just sitting there or laying there if you're laying down when you're into a jhana. And the weird part about it, and I'm not sure how this works, but no, I've seen it too often to doubt it. But in a jhana, you are invulnerable. 
who was uh, one of the disciples over in Sri Lanka. He was a doctor and how one of his friends you know, could get into some jhanas pretty easily. And he never asked permission of this man who was in jhana, but the doctor just, when this fellow was in jhana, he just uh, rolled up the sleeve of the shirt of this uh, Sri Lankan boy in jhana and uh, was dis disinfected the arm and got out a scalpel to try and make an incision in the arm. And no matter how hard he pressed in a very sharp scalpel, the scalpel would not penetrate the skin. And it was a dangerous experiment which he did, but he did that since it was one of those examples. Within a jhana, you can't feel your body, but the body looks after itself. And also the body doesn't move either. It's just like a little rock. There's many, many more stories about that. The one which is in the suttas was of these two villagers finding a monk in, in a jhana in the middle of the forest. And they thought he was dead. So they were Buddhists, they had faith in the Sangha. So they said, we can't leave him to be eaten by the animals. So they got some wood They're in the forest, made a funeral pyre, put the monk on top and started the fire. Once the fire was established, the two villagers just went off to do their business. And we were really impressed the following morning when that monk came on arms round in the village and even his robe wasn't charred or burned at all. And that's in a, one of the stories the Buddha told in the suttas. Strange. I mean, I, I've seen that and it's true. Within those jhanas, your body is so safe. Does that answer your question? You wanted to ask some more. I can't hear you. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. There is a bit more, but I think um, it turned out it wasn't quite the question I was, that I thought I was asking. But oh, okay, yeah. But it was a good, yeah. it was a good probably a better answer. Yeah. About a question. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad you're satisfied. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I have another question here about jhanas, which seems relevant to the last one. Yeah. So uh, yeah. someone's asking, is it important how long you stay in a jhana? And is it possible to go from one to another intentionally? Yeah, it's it, the length of time has no real meaning because. I even mentioned this this afternoon when I was giving another talk to another place, that it's like your will, your wanting, creates the idea, the perception of time. And one of the characteristics within the jhana, there's no wanting left. You know, you're sort of free of that, uh, that uh, will, that choice, that uh, momentum to go places. It's just still, you're stopped but perfectly aware, very highly awake and alert. It's not like in sleep where you're not really quite sure where you are, or not like kind of anesthetic where you have no mindfulness at all. This is really high super mindfulness. But just um, the, event, the idea of time doesn't make any sense. So what usually happens, the deeper in the jhanas you are, the deeper jhanas, the longer you last in those jhanas because... You don't know what's going on as far as time is concerned when you're within the jhana. But you know, when you come out, you say, wow, it's two hours. I was perfectly awake and alert all that time. Where did that time go? And, but, you know, two hours is a small amount of time for a really good jhana. The deeper the jhana, the longer the time you find there because it's so stable. You know, it just, it's like a rock. You, you can't move it. You don't want to move it. That's why the stability of those states is a sign that they are real jhanas. You don't do a jhana just for a minute or two minutes or five minutes. They have to be much longer than that to really qualify as a real beautiful jhana. And the deeper the jhana, the second jhana, the third jhana, the fourth jhana, the longer you will stay there. It's nature. So, and can you move from one to the other within a jhana? Of course, it, but that movement is natural. It's not decided by you. Once you're in uh, any jhana, 
basically you can't make decisions. So what will happen is you know, have these wonderful experiences, the body disappears incredibly still and blissful and aware inside. And when you come out afterwards, you'll be able to recall just you know, whether that was a single jhana or whether you move from a first jhana to a second jhana within that uh, time frame. And if you come out, you have to come out the way you went in, from first jhana to second jhana, third, second jhana back to the first and then out. And so you can recall all of that, but you can't take notes while you're within the jhana realms. These are just the experiences which you can recall very clearly afterwards. Unfortunately, in English, we don't have words to describe the intensity of those experiences. Except the nearest word we have, and this is why it is so frustrating sometimes to explain these things, is like a trauma. A trauma is an unforgettable experience, but totally negative. It's like a trauma, which is unforgettable, but it's totally positive. And so it's so powerful. It leaves uh, such a clear memory afterwards of what it was like within those deep states of, of meditation. And you find in those deep states of meditation, you find out afterwards what you know, jhana you were in for most of the time and what happened in those jhanas. And also because you can remember very clearly what it was like within, then you have the opportunity to use those experiences as data for the arising of insight. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you. Ajahn. <clears throat> right, so we have another question. I enjoy meditation, but need to be more regular in my practice. I never set an alarm for the end of the session, but I do time myself. I found that I become unrestful around 30 minutes and that's when I finish my meditation. Should I commit to an hour, no matter what the quality of my meditation? Should I demand more of myself? No, don't demand more of yourself. But stop even like timing how long you were in meditation. Because that comes a habit. Already you're assuming that 30 minutes is when you get restless. Every meditation will be different. So next time you meditate, just forget about the clocks, unless you have a really important engagement afterwards. And just sit there, and if it's still having a wonderful time, just carry on. There are times when you want to meditate for longer, for an hour. There are times when 15 minutes is enough for you. How much food do you eat every day on your plate? Sometimes you're so hungry, you eat lots. Sometimes you don't need very much, so you don't eat very much. Same with the jhanas. Sometimes you just, well, it's not jhanas, so just meditation. Sometimes just the mind just wants to carry on, so let it carry on. So again, don't be a prisoner of time. However, you know, if you have an appointment, you know, you've got to go to work or you've got to, I don't know, do something which is important, then you may sort of set an alarm clock. But even that is just so disturbing. The better way of doing this, uh, of timing yourself if you have to, is just as you start your meditation, make a, a resolution, a determination. I will come out at five minutes to one in the afternoon or something. I will emerge at five minutes to one. I will emerge at five minutes to one. In your own words, you say that to yourself as clear as possible. And then you forget about it. And it's amazing how effective that is. You have your own clocks inside. And instead of worrying about it, you open your eyes. Wow, it's five minutes to one. But you only do that if you need to. It's much better to keep meditation a natural process. If the mind is still enjoying the peace and the stillness and the bliss, please let it. Okay. Okay, this is a, a little bit of a hard question, Ajahn. Excellent. Possibly. <laughs> Dear Ajahn Brown, my question is, why do we not see many nuns from Dhammasara Monastery giving talks on the BSWA YouTube channel? Thank you very much for your teachings. Feeling extremely grateful. Uh, myself, other monks, senior monks, members of our committee, people on the audiovisual team, many times we've asked the same question. We cannot take a, a nun or a monk or anybody and put them in front of a camera and say, teach. But many times they have been invited. 
many times. We said, please come on, the stage is yours. Please come and teach. But they haven't done that. So it's not for the want of monks like me trying. They're very inspiring, the bhikkhudis at Dharmasala. They have a lot to share. In the moment, they haven't just, not even volunteered, they haven't agreed to actually to share their teachings widely. And I know sometimes that as a senior monk, you've got so many things to do, and sometimes you feel, oh, come on, uh, fellow sisters, uh, you, can, you can join in. But you know today, today that Sajjan Bamali spent uh, most of the day uh, doing a course on Paticca Samupada. And we had 10 of the bhikkhunis came down for the, no, nine, nine came down for the day. And it was wonderful because they came down for the day and there was four monks here, including myself, Ajahn Bamali, and a couple of other monks. They had to go on the arms round for the food in our hall. All in order of reigns. There's no monks first and the nuns last. It was, you know, whoever's a senior, they are just in front of the one who is junior. It's wonderful to see that. There's one, there's one Thai woman, Thai Buddhist, who'd never seen that before. And she asked, what's going on? But what I was really impressed with is everybody else saw that. And there may be about 150 people in the hall. And 150 people thought it was as natural as could be. It's wonderful to have that now, that sort of on big occasions that nuns can walk in order of their reigns. Such an ah, obvious no brainer. Okay. Yeah. But it's nice <laughs> to see, and it was a nice thing for me to see. So we're getting there, but come on, Damasara nuns, come on, give some talks. Yeah, they need to help me out, Ajahn, as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> all right thank you for that question um there's another question on deep stuff so yes. could you please explain more about how to rightly view consciousness as impermanent it seems that for many buddhist teachings consciousness is what links one life to the next which to me uh, seems to create a view of continuity in consciousness how do we reconcile these two okay first of all you never say consciousness, say consciousnesses. Because if you look at the way that even the Buddha taught, we are talking about Buddhism, there's six different types of consciousness, totally different types. A sight, hearing, smell, taste, physical touch, and knowing, mind consciousness. And most people refer to mind consciousness when they think of the stream of consciousness going from one life to another. And it is the mind consciousness which you know, crosses that bridge. But that mind consciousness, when you really get to know it, you see it as just like the old um, movies, which I used to see when I was a kid. And you have a look at the, the vinyl uh, reel of film and you find it's not continuous. It's just separate slides, separate photographs, which go through the projector so fast it gives the illusion of continuity. There's no continuity there at all. It's a different slides, one after the other, give that illusion. And it's the same with the consciousness of your mind. Now it just, it just um, changes so fast. But you know, with a decent meditation, you can start to see that. You start to see that you know, there's a stream of consciousness, what the Buddha said. And, streams like if you go and watch the river thames river thames today over your closest bridge looks the same as it did last week but it's totally different water so what you think is consciousness this process is totally different from moment to moment but it's this one conscious moment and can be a cause for the next conscious moment which can be the cause for the next so this is cause and effect. The talk I gave this morning on my dependent origination talk, I mentioned the simile of the mango. You eat a mango, it's nice getting different similes. So I invented this simile to try and help people understand about 
what goes from one life to the next. You eat the mango, you get the seed, you plant the seed in the, in the garden. Soon that seed will split and a little shoot will come up. It starts to germinate and that shoot grows underground. You can't see it. And soon it pokes its way up above the level of the soil. And that grows into what looks like a piece of grass, but then that gets wooden and the stem is a sapling. And it grows bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's a small tree and then it may throw off some branches and it gets bigger and bigger over the months and the years until it becomes a small tree with many branches and many twigs and many leaves. And then you get the time it throws off its first flowers. And those flowers get uh, pollinated and the stem of the flowers you know, swells, becomes a bulge. And then that soon becomes a mango. And then when that's ripe, it falls to the ground and you can eat it. What went from the first mango to the next mango? And there's nothing which is in the first mango, which is in the second mango. There's a process, a cause and effect process. Every part of that process, you can see it happen. This moment causes that moment. That moment causes this moment. That next moment causes the next moment. And that's like the process of our life. And especially the process of when a person dies, just that process continues on to the next mango, the next Venerable Chanda, the next, whoever asked that question, <laughs> you can see what happens. And the Buddha said, not the same, not different. Right. Thank you. Um, there's a message from Mary Ng, uh, who oh, would yes. like to ask a question herself. Yes, certainly. Mary. Can we find her? She's probably trying to press the right button. Here we go. Hi, Ashan. Hi. 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 Alexander actually would like to ask you the question. Um, yeah. Hi, Alexander. Yeah. Hi. Do you mind to get into a genre? Do I? Sorry. How do you clear your mind in meditation? To get okay. How do you clear your mind? It's being this present moment right now. What is happening right now? Not much. But if you start thinking of the past or the future, the mind gets very, very busy. It has lots of stuff. So whatever you're experiencing right now, make that the most important thing in the whole world. The objects of this present moment. And number two, be kind to it. Care for it. Whatever you're experiencing now is the most important thing in the world. And care for it. That way you get a very powerful mind and a very clear mind. Give that a try. <laughs> very good. Okay. You know where that came from? That didn't come from the Buddha. That came from Leo Tolstoy. And it was the Emperor's Three Questions adapted to the meditation practice. Great. So um, should we do one more question before we have a short meditation period? Yeah, sure. Does that sound good? I did, yeah, I did see one came up there. Can one meditate for days without eating? Sometimes there was that story of that monk who came to teach a retreat in Sydney, in Australia. And <clears throat> it's a wonderful story. He was a Theravadan monk, but from Vietnam. And when they met together the first day on a nine day retreat, he started meditating. And he meditated for eight days without moving, without uh, going to the toilet, without drinking, and certainly not with eating. And afterwards, when he came out after eight days, he apologized. He said he got into one of the deep meditations. In those deep meditations, you don't need to eat or drink. You're hardly breathing. And he was having a wonderful time. He just didn't know it was eight days. It's just a long time. Because time has no meaning for you in those days. States. Perfectly healthy. But everybody on that retreat was really, they were blown away by just the fact that that could be done. You know, in a modern age. 
And so they're really, really impressed and say, you don't just say, ask forgiveness. You didn't give us any teachings or any interviews or anything. We're just so impressed to see what can happen in deep meditation. Right. So don't, don't try to do that by force. So I'm not going to eat, I'm going to fast. <laughs> it's, you know, try to not lose weight or whatever. You don't actually lose weight because you don't consume any of that, whatever you got in your tummy. It just uh, stops for a little while. Yeah, sorry. Next question, yeah. Okay, should we um, have one more before the break from yes. Alicia? I think Alicia would like to ask this herself. Yes, certainly. I hope I'm saying your name properly. Uh, can you hear Hi. me? Hi. Yes, I can see you too. Hi. Oh, hey. <laughs> Hi, Hi, Adam. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, and it's so nice to see you. Uh, I want to say that I visit I visited your monastery in uh, like I don't remember the place, but it was close to Perth. Yes, yeah. And I'm from Poland, and uh, ah, queer. <laughs> ah, <laughs> you were. <laughs> and uh, you weren't there so i think i i, I was mistaken and i chose the, the wrong day but oh, i yes. found some uh flowers on the ground and i took it <laughs> ah, okay <laughs> Just instead of you know uh yeah so i'm so glad i finally can uh like talk to you and see you Good. and it's so exciting <laughs> because I listened to your talks for so many years now and it's, oh, great. Yeah, it's just so so exciting to to be able to talk to you so I forgot my question <laughs> <laughs> no no but but I, I kind of do remember something yeah. okay, I have yes. your question <laughs> you do yeah. I do yeah would you like to remember it or would you like me to read it uh I, thank you. I will try to uh, do it myself. So okay. the question is about anger, and I th I think it's not only about anger. It's it's about all the these emotions like uh, sadness and shame and guilt and anxiety, uh, which we we I don't know we somebody like to think about them as negative. Yeah, and I, I just I just feel like they're being stigmatized, probably also okay. by me, if yeah. I'm talking about it, basically. Yeah, and I feel like even in Buddhist talks, yeah. uh, the titles of the talks are you know like how how to like deal with anger, how to transform the anger, yeah. how, be, how yeah. to deal with difficult emotions. It's always something to kill, deal, transform. Yeah. get rid of it you know they're yeah. not good <laughs> and yeah. i just i just feel like i've got a like a problem <laughs> with, uh, <laughs> with uh, how 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 do i look at them the way so they don't get bigger just because they're being called negative you know yeah, there's a okay. story about that that um that that woman that used to talk with animals and there was an animal oh, yeah. that he got a name that was like a devil or something. Oh, and yes, I remember that. It's you know, you know that story? Yeah, in South Africa, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, you know how it ended? Yeah, the, the animal was just so happy that they changed his name. Exactly. And he felt much better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's what I'm talking about. Like, we, we call these feelings names and we we decide that they're wrong and mm. I feel that like I do it too I, I call it something bad and that's how I cannot deal with it as oh, maybe yeah. would if I wouldn't so I just wanted to know your opinion about anger and do you feel like there's a healthy way of expressing it because okay could we yeah. stop there could could yes. we put that question yeah. to Ajahn there thanks yeah okay yeah Okay, yeah, I mean, just, <laughs> I really get what you're saying. It's a very, very, very good point. But, you know, it's just like the two bad bricks in the wall. You just focus about the two bad bricks in the wall and think it's a bad wall. And sometimes uh, when we look at anger, sometimes we just we take it out of a person's life and we focus on that, forget what went before, what went afterwards. And sometimes we see the whole picture of the relationship and the timing 
that sometimes anger, well, okay, don't get angry at being angry. That's called double anger. Don't get depressed about being depressed. And a lot of times you know, I've used that to, you know, to serve people. So when they're depressed, there's many advantages in being depressed. Number one, you can get time off work. <laughs> Number two, you can eat whatever you want. <laughs> and so sometimes when you see the positive side of depression or anger or whatever else it is you have, then you find that, what's, is it really still anger? Is it really still depression? You've taken away the stigma of the negativity which you have towards that. And so it's not really anger anymore. You can shout, but it hasn't got the same sort of um, uh, sharpness to it. So if you're angry, that's, we call that in Buddhism, it's a result of old karma. And what's most important is what you're doing with what you have. And stigmatizing it just adds more negativity to it. So if you're anger, yay, anger, my good old friend. I've been angry for a long time now. So you can start to celebrate anger. You find the anger doesn't last. It can't last like that. You're depressed and just make the most of depression. Really get into enjoy it. If you can do that, it's, depression's gone. You try and get rid of the depression. I feel negative about it. Of course, you're feeding it. You're getting angrier, angry, afraid of fear. Of course, it's feeding it, makes it worse. So sometimes when you have shame, Yay! Enjoy your shame. Tell everyone about it. Let people know what you're ashamed of. What am I ashamed of? What did I do recently? Oh, that's sweet. Yeah, I remember that time when I went. What? No, what happened? Oh, that some time ago, you probably heard the story when I went to do some chanting for a, a man who was sick in the, the ICU. And it was really good chanting, he got better. But I, I forgot actually to ask the family if they wanted him to get better because actually they just wanted me to chant for a peaceful death. And I've got it wrong. I love telling people that story because there's different chants. Now, little prayers which we do as Buddhist monks, senior monks, for people for different sets, uh, different experiences of their life. One of the other wrong chantings which I did was when I was doing a marriage chant for some a couple but unfortunately, I was tired and I did the funeral chant instead. <laughs> and they're still together, happily married. I did tell them that I'd actually done the wrong chant when I was marrying them. <laughs> so when you make mistakes, I'm not ashamed of making mistakes. I'm making mis mistakes. Making mistakes. You tell people, let them know. And then you can celebrate. Don't feel ashamed. Why feel ashamed? You're a human being. We all do stupid things sometimes. When I may do a stupid thing, I always like to share it with others. It makes them laugh. It makes them feel happy. Great. So um, I think it's time for a little meditation pause now. Okay. Uh, how long for? Uh, it's minutes? up to you, Ajahn. Maybe 10 minutes? Five, 10 minutes? Okay. Whatever okay, you yeah. think is best. Okay. So. When we're doing the meditation, any of you who need to go to the toilet, go to the toilet and remember the toilet is like letting go. <laughs> it's like it's meditation. <laughs> so anyway, for those who don't need to go to the toilet, sit down, close your eyes, and come into this present moment. No past, no future. To help you come into the present moment, you try this little exercise, which I haven't taught for a while, but I used to teach quite regularly. Imagine that you've just been shopping. You've got two heavy shopping bags, one in your left hand, one in your right hand. And they're so heavy, they make your arms ache and your shoulders hurt. And you imagine the bag in your left hand. It's got some writing on the outside. And the words on the outside of that bag are the four letters P-A-S-T. Because in that bag, you carry all your memories of the past, both good and bad. 
You've been carrying them for a long time. No wonder it makes you ache. And in the right hand, you've got the letters on the bag, the shopping bag you're holding, F-U-T-U-R-E, the future. All your hopes and anxieties, your fears and dreams of what might happen, all packed into that shopping bag in the right hand, the future. And they're so heavy. They make your, your brain so tired and your heart weak and depressed. So you realize where that tiredness, physical and emotional, come from. And you focus now on the shopping bag in your left hand, the past. And you imagine leaning your back to the left, allowing you to lower the bag of your past to the ground. And when it meets the floor, all the weight vanishes. The burden, the heaviness is gone. And you uncurl your fingers from the handle and you straighten your back so your left arm and hand can hang loosely by your side. You've relaxed by letting go of the bag containing your past. And then you focus on the bag in your right hand containing your fears, anxieties, dreams of your future, which is also really heavy and tiring. And you imagine your body leaning to the right, allowing you to lower that bag down to the ground slowly. When it meets the floor, then you can uncurl your fingers and move your hand away from the handle of that shopping bag. And as you straighten your body, your right hand and your right arm can now relax and recuperate. And you look down on the ground, you see these two heavy bags containing your past and your future. They're not heavy anymore. You put them down. And you are standing in this wonderful place between them called the present moment relaxing and resting because you deserve to rest just in this moment. How does that feel? You don't have to worry about your past and future because those bags will be there to pick up afterwards. You also know that when you relax and rest, they become much lighter. At least that's how they appear afterwards. But now you're in this moment. And how do you feel in this moment? What are you aware of right now? Whatever it is that you are aware of, please care for it. Open the door of your heart to whatever's happening right now. You don't try and choose anything. Just whatever's here, you're aware of and you give it kindness. So you and this moment can be friends. When you and this moment come together and you're kind to it, and it becomes soft and easy. You can stay here for however long you wish and becomes a pleasant abiding. First of all, it's just relaxing when you don't have to achieve anything, get anything, go anywhere or get rid of anything. You're just being here with kindness in this moment. And no fear. You usually find that as the seconds tick by, as the minutes come and go, in this moment, just caring for it, you become more and more peaceful, more and more content, more and more at ease. This is peace happening. You get to know what peace feels like, and especially the delight of peace. Peace feels good. 
You don't have to do anything. You just be kind to whatever you're experiencing right now. The longer you practice like this, the deeper you get. We haven't got time to go into deep meditations, but this is enough for now. So please open your eyes and come back to this easy questions for a very, very soft meditator. Okay, hope you enjoyed that. Thank you very much. There are quite a lot of questions and it's interesting to see the themes. They go from motherhood to uh, human rights, to ordaining and to matters of consciousness. So I thought we could start with a, a question about human rights. So someone's yeah. asking, could you please say some encouraging words for people in the world who are standing up at this moment for human rights, for freedom and peace, as it happens in this moment in the German town of Leipzig? Thank you. Oh, excellent. Yes, you know, sometimes we have to do that. Sometimes, but when you're standing up, you know, for human rights, also remember the other parts of humanity, like the kindness and respect. But sometimes that people who are, there's no enemies there, we're in this together, and we have to care for one another. And even if it's, you know, the people on the other side of the barricades, even the riot police, it's wonderful to be able to see a riot policeman and just say, you know, I love you, I care for you, and really mean it. Why they're in that job, maybe because that's the only job they can do to feed their family. But anyway, just stand up for the human rights and be kind. That's the most powerful way of creating the right of human beings to be respected, to be different than you, and you know, to be able to have that freedom to live a life where they can explore and enjoy you know, this world and so they can also understand just who they are, how they work and how they interact with others. It doesn't need to be violent, it can always be peaceful. Great. Thank you. So now somebody's asking you about being a mother, Ajahn, so since you're the mother yeah. to many people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So well, we have, have this, this word, yeah, the word about just like a mother loves her only child, will give her life for that child. That's in the Metta Sutta, which always has a lot of meaning. And you know, even that, and I've seen mothers, and the mother, please excuse me, fathers, but mother has more love for the child than the father has for the child. It's, it's a deeper connection there. But you know, in motherhood, it's a great sacrifice, but why is it something which is, you know, that something which is spiritual. One of the reasons is because a mother has to let go so much. But if you are a mother, please, your job is to not to force your child into some idea of who you want your son to be or who you want your daughter to be. Your job is to nurture them, give them all the tools you know, of goodness and kindness, be able to feel, to be able to be... Uh, to be able to be honest, that's one of the biggest things we can give our children. To be honest and true to themselves. And sometimes they may argue with you, but if they're being honest, it's a wonderful thing. So don't actually make them afraid of you. As many children are afraid of their parents. And to the point that your child can come up to you and just say terrible things which they've performed and done. Because they're in big trouble. And you will never punish them as long as they're being honest. Children should have this amnesty with their parents. They've done something wrong, they need their parents to talk to, to understand why it was wrong. And so they can make sure that any mess is cleaned up. That's what parents are there for. And the last thing was you know, the father's love for a child. And my father's love, who once told me, he said, son, you can do whatever you like in this world for the door of my house will always be open to you. He meant his heart. And that just meant so much to me, it's called unconditional love. And it meant I could trust my father. 
and it also meant that I became a good person, even though I could always have a place to stay and food. But my father just gave me that blank check. No matter what you do in your life, son, you are my son. So the door of my house will always be open to you. I will never take my love away from you. And it was the first time I learned what unconditional love was. Please explain that to your children. And they will always live up to your trust. Never abuse it. I can't hear you. General Chanda, you are muted. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. So this person's also asking that she has a small two-year-old super active child at home. So it's really yeah. hard to concentrate the mind. It's really not easy. And thank you for your letter from Bodhi Nyana. You've written oh, okay. to this lady. She said, uh, your lessons are like a treat and honey for the heart. Greetings okay. from Ireland. Oh, nice. From yeah. her and her son. Yeah, sometimes your son, it drives you crazy. <laughs> but then afterwards, you wouldn't have it any other way. That's your son, and you love him to absolute bits. And, and sometimes if you express that to the son, and sometimes I don't know what the son's condition is, but sometimes that son knows that mother really loves it, really loves it, and you can't get a better therapy than that to actually to love your son so much that they feel it. And then after a while, the son just calms down because... They have this beautiful sense of oh, empathy towards the mum. I've seen that even with autistic kids. And so empathy just comes when they feel a bit more safe with someone they know as strongly as their mother. Okay. You're muted. To us. Oh. Yeah, okay. Mary has a question that she would like yeah. to ask herself. So if you'd okay. like to ask that, Mary. Mary Cooch. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can see you as well. Oh, good. Hi. Okay. Yeah. Um, so my life is, is okay. I have, a, I have two children. I have a 29 year old son. 31 year old daughter and a three month old grandson um, oh. but I'm, I'm always worrying about them and um, <laughs> worrying about bad things happening to them which is stopping me from actually enjoying the nice you know the nice lives and the situations that they have so I wondered if you had some advice about that I, your meditation on the two suitcases was very timely actually that that's Good. my problem I can't let go of the future suitcase yeah, but after a while you let it go for a short period of time and you find it's nice and free and nothing goes wrong. And you let go for a few seconds and then a few minutes, then a few hours. And you find that, why not? Because the anxiety, if you are going to look at the future, if you pick up those suitcases again, especially the future suitcase, just sort out the stuff in that suitcase and or the bag and keep all the positive stuff. Because anxiety is looking at the future and all the things which might go wrong. And instead of looking at the future and all the things which might go right. And the story is, I can't beat this story from Winnie the Pooh. Winnie the Pooh and his little friend Piglet were walking through the forest. <laughs> I think you know the story. And there was a storm coming up and little Piglet, being a small fellow, was so anxious. And so what would happen if a tree fell where we were underneath it? And the answer to that problem, what would happen if a tree fell when we were underneath it, was what would happen if a tree didn't fall when we were underneath it, which was far more likely, which means you could give away all of the terrible um, anxiety and enjoy life. Because you know, your children and grandchildren, what a wonderful thing you have. So instead of just uh, looking at all the things which might go wrong with them, Look at all the things which might go right with them. And they're your part of that and you can enjoy and celebrate it. Okay. If, you do pick up the, if you do pick up the suitcase, all the negative thoughts, put those away outside and just pick up the, the positive ones, which are far more likely. 
<laughs> okay, we have a couple of uh, ordination questions. So yeah. the first one is that I would like to ordain, but my mom is dependent financially on me. How mm. to accept this without aversion? Oh, it's just no, your mother's not always going to be there. And, you know, there comes a time when your mother is you know, unfortunately no more. And then you can ordain. But is she really dependent upon you? Maybe what you can do is just you know, to work hard, save up, and to get a sort of a, a fund uh, for your mother so that you know, she has enough to look after herself. And you can become sort of a monk or a nun. And even no. if your mother gets a nun, okay, even if your nun gets, your mum gets very sick. We had this wonderful case of one of the monks, he was a good friend of mine, and he went to stay with his mum for, I always get the time wrong, it was a really long time, it was 11 or 12 years or something. Yeah. And because he only thought he would look after his mum in the, you know, the last dying months. But he was such a good carer for his mother, she kept on getting better and then getting worse. And so he looked after her for 11 years. And it was a wonderful little sacrifice, which he did. And sacrifice, it was just an expression of love and kindness for his mother. He's a wonderful monk. And so that's just because you're a monk or a nun doesn't mean you can't look after your parents. Obviously, you can't work and get financial support for them, but you can do that you know, before they pass away or before you become, a, um, uh, before you become ordained. So it's not a big problem. You don't have a version, just find a skillful solution. And there's many skillful solutions around for you. Okay. So another one of, uh, from somebody who wants to be a nun. So you had to give the right answer, Ajahn. Okay. <laughs> I was th uh, since every year, I know that I want to become a monastic. I was thinking about traveling and visiting some monasteries, but now it seems like that won't be an option for a long time. Um, what place would you suggest for a European woman? I'm living in Poland, having a lay teacher. My friend who was also about to travel to you to be ordained. Yeah. But COVID happened. Um, Aya Adimuti told me that Myanmar might be a nice place to start, but then I'm afraid that my mom, who is elderly, would be devastated, being afraid yeah. of me every day if I go so far away to a different country. It's not really easy in this world situation, but every day... I feel that if not now, then maybe never. Oh, no, don't ever think like that. Not now, not never. Because even like COVID, you know, it just was noticed over here in Australia. Now there's international flights between New Zealand and Australia. And things get better. They get better slowly, but you know, things do actually improve. And, you know, it'd be wonderful. That's one of the reasons why... Now, I've committed myself to support the Anacampa Bikuni project, no matter what it takes. And actually, you now after a while, to get some really good nuns uh, over in the UK to ordain that the UK is not that far from Poland. And your know, mother can come and visit. If you can come and ordain over in the UK, then your mother can come and visit. And you do that for three or four or five years. And I would hope and expect and you go back to Poland and start something over there. There's no doubt in my mind, there's heaps and heaps and heaps of people. They want to become monks, or they want to become nuns, but they just don't have the facilities for that. That's one of the reasons, and I, I, I do feel that just quite so deeply. You know, I'm just work, I should really just be retiring now and just living a nice, easy life. But still you work hard to try and make enough monasteries for monks and nuns in this world to meet the need. And those monks, those monasteries, it's one thing having a Burmese monastery sort of in Poland or in UK. It's one thing having a Thai monastery in that place, but there's something about that, those cultures, because they are foreign cultures, they're not really a an, 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 an British monastery or Polish monastery want to make sure that in each of these monasteries they are sensitive and reflecting the culture in which they're situated so that we can have like eventually a, a monastery for nuns in Poland where other Polish women can feel comfortable, loved and cared for 
Because without that care, that loving kindness, that sense of safety in the monastery, it's so hard to meditate. If you're a great meditator, you can do it. But there's so many obstacles there when you're not, you don't feel safe, you don't feel loved, encouraged and respected for whatever reason. So I've seen that, I know that. So it's wonderful to be able to have our local monasteries supported. And I'm not quite sure when COVID in Poland or COVID in, in UK is going to get less and less and less. I would actually usually think because the European winter, everyone gets a bit negative in winter time. I think when the, the grass starts to come out again and the leaves start to blossom and the little birds start to fly through the air once again, I think that then we find a big change in the story of COVID in Europe. Okay. Springtime, it changes people's attitude and change people's attitude is really important with people's health. Yeah. Okay, um, someone's asking about the final thought moment. So they're asking how important is the final thought during your last breath or dying? If so, what happens to all the good and bad karma one has already accumulated? Thank you. <laughs> yes, exactly. There is no such thing as a final thought moment. Because death is a, a series of moments. It takes a while for a person to go from life to death. And I've been with, with several people in their dying moments and I was quite amazed as you see just how the body starts to turn off, how their senses start to shut down and how I asked member many doctors, when was actually the moment they died? And the doctors, you know, would say, you can't say, it was sometime between 10 past and 20 past. What was it 12 minutes past or 30 minutes and 50 seconds past? They said, no, you can't say that. The death is a process like everything else. So first of all, it's not a thought moment. And I know that sometimes people say, but it says in this book, it says in that book, please believe the evidence Trust your own experience rather than anything which is written in any book or anything which I say. And then you find that you should always put the truth of your own experience ahead of any sort of dogma. But then you find out that because it's many moments, what you think about when you die or in your dying moments will always be just almost like a sum total of how you behaved in your life especially those last few months or few years or few days of your life. And it's not something you can control. It's not something like, okay, I'm going to be a really bad person, but then my last moments, I'll be good. I have to remember what to think when I die. Because you find out that when you get to that point, that it's your, your character, your nature comes up and all the good karma which you've done in the past, that has a good opportunity of coming to the fore and actually just you think about those things. And if you're lucky enough to have good people around you, they will keep reminding you of that when you die. All the wonderful things which you've done in your life. And then of course, oh, you just get blissed out. So it's not just one last thought, it's a series of thoughts. Okay. Uh, there's another question about that place between life and death. Could you mm. please clarify which of the five aggregates is the Manomaya Kaya, mind made body, made. Does it explain why some people in near death experiences and out of the body experiences are capable of perceiving, e.g. seeing or hearing without using the physical sense organs? Yes, Does it explain indeed. why we tend to get reborn on the same planet instead of some far away planet? Many thanks <laughs> for training these amazing, wonderful bhikkhunis and bhikkhus and all yeah. of us. Excellent. Now that is actually true that uh, when a person passes away, the senses, the six senses, the five of them shut down. And the sixth sense, the mind, the stream of mental consciousness continues on. And that mental consciousness you know, also has the four candors, it doesn't have the body candor. And the, the way that Vedna and perception happens, especially perception, it creates 
this mind made body what you imagine your body to be how you think it should be there's so many lovely stories of people dying and the mind made body is the last thing which they knew which was usually just how they were dressed in their coffins and so you have the people that mind made bodies don't become naked or anything they have their clothes as they were in their coffins and it's a wonderful amazing thing to see it's a it's as if they feel that that's who they are and how they're dressed. And that's how they perceive themselves and that's what they project onto other people. So it is, they have uh, the four candors of Vedana, Sanya, Sankara, and obviously the single Vinyana. Until that single Vinyana just goes into the next life, you know, it just progresses, and then in the process, and then eventually they just get the other um, kanda of, of physical form, and also just the uh, other senses. So that's actually how it works. And just the mind is an amazing thing because it also has you know, its, its perception and its sankaras and it has its memory as well. And the memory of the mind is much, much stronger than the memory of the brain. And that's why we use hypnosis or deep meditation to access some of these memories which you cannot access any other way. And the, the accurate memories of previous lives or what it was like when you were born. Those are great memories to be able to access. So you actually know what was happening. Somebody asked me, I gave a talk on dependent origination this morning, I said to, to people in Canada. And just to say, well, can you know every one of the factors of dependent origination, like death, right now? I said, of course you can. What you have to do is get into very deep meditation as you're coming out to be able to access the last time you died. Because that memory you have is just a clear recollection of what it was like. Accurate, truthful, sometimes painful. But you know what death is. Those past memories, not like the memories you have in the brain, re-experiencing that time, that place. Okay, can't hear you. You're muted. Not sure why. <laughs> Do you have a story that can remind ourselves to stop procrastination, especially about walking on the path? Yes, uh, a story to stop procrastination. Well, for me, I'd always actually put off procrastination until tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, so... But also just more like pro priorities. It's not really procrastination. It's sometimes other things getting in the way. And the story which comes to mind is the story of the, the big jar. The, the professor who came into his audience, his uh, students, with a big jar, like a flower pot, but no, made out of glass. And he put it on the table, never said anything, but from his briefcase, got out some stones and put the stones into the jar until he could get no more stones in the jar. And then he asked the, the, um, the class, is the jar full now? He said, yeah, it's full. And he smiled, and from his briefcase, he got some smaller stones. He could fit many of those smaller stones in the gaps between the big stones. Is it full now? And they said, no, you probably figured something else to put in that jar. He smiled and got some fine sand in, put the fine sand in, shook it, so much of that fine sand could find the spaces between the rocks and the small stones. Is it full yet? And they all nodded, they all shook their heads, no. He got the water and poured the water in until he could get no more water in. And after the end of that little demonstration, the professor said, what am I trying to demonstrate here? What's the purpose of this? And because it was a university in our modern times, one student put up their hand, so it tells us, no matter how busy we are, we can always fit something more in. <laughs> he said, no, that's not the meaning. The meaning of this demonstration is, if you want to put the big stones in, the precious stones, they have to go in first. And so there's a message about priorities. Other things, you can always find space for them afterwards. In your day, schedule in 
the important things of your life, like rest, like eating, like meditation, like time with your friends and family. Those are really important for your health and well-being. So those are the things we don't procrastinate about. Other stuff, emails and stuff, you can do those another day. <laughs> You're muted again. Unless uh, we're waiting for your email to say that you've lost your link to this session, then we oh, have no, to do it, it immediately. <laughs> oh, no, it all worked out. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good job we didn't wait till tomorrow. <laughs> oh, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'd like to invite Diana to ask a question. Diana Randall? Hi. Okay, hi. Hi, Ajahn nice Brown, you, greetings from London. <laughs> from um, I was very disappointed to miss your retreat in Easter. Mm -hmm. I was in Perth yeah. and cancelled. Oh, you were? Um, I was on your retreat. I'm supposed to be on it. Um, but how come you didn't come? Well, because it was cancelled. Oh, that's true, yeah. <laughs> there we go. And uh, then there was. I was very happy to be in, per in Perth for five months for the whole of the... Okay. Lockdown which was very pleasant. Okay. But now I'm back in London um, and for the second lockdown, not as bad mm. as the first, apparently. But yeah. I just wanted to say, um, you know, I sort of, the time, I work in mental health. And so yes. a lot of the things I hear are like Eric, who I really empathize with, you know, there's his yes, situation, yeah. there's so much of that. Yeah. Um, the things that are going on in the world. I mean, I actually had to ask permission to leave Australia Oh, yes, yeah. Which made me angry, so I relate to Alicia as well. Yeah, yes, yeah, <laughs> and a lot yeah. of things make me angry. But I just wondered, because of this really dark time that the whole world is in at the moment, what, you know, there's, there's prophecies in the Mayan tradition, the Christian, <laughs> and so on, uh, Tibetan Buddhism, the Dark Age. I just wondered, is there anything in Theravadan Buddhism, and what are your thoughts on this time that we're in? It's a light age. It's a beautiful age. This is the first time we've had bhikkhunis for centuries. We have bhikkhunis going in line according to their range retreat. We have Zoom meetings where we don't need to have a retreat where people actually stay in the same place together. You can have uh, question and answer sessions with monks where you don't need to sort of pack your bags and and, <laughs> and nuns. You don't need to pack your bags and go through customs and go through all sorts of many places. There's so many wonderful things going on right now. So I don't, sometimes if you look for the, the, the dark shadows, of course there's dark shadows there, but the only way you can have shadows, there must be some light somewhere to create shadows. There must be some beautiful stuff to create darkness. So the two go side by side. So we don't just stay in the darkness. We don't just stay in the shadows. We look to, why is that a shadow? There must be some source of light somewhere. And so we go to the light. And look, quite frankly, I just do not accept dark ages or dark times. If too many people believe in that, they create the darkness. If many people just believe in the light, in kindness, there's so many kind and beautiful, generous, loving people in this world. Oh, stand up and shout your love. Instead of always shouting, oh, it's terrible times, we're all going to die. Oh, my goodness me, Ajahn Brahm, you're getting old. Yeah, of course I'm getting old, but I'm enjoying my old age. <laughs> in other words, whatever happens to you in life, that's the result of old karma. What you're doing is what you've got. It's the karma we're making now. And we can always make something beautiful, no matter what we have. And it's always an inspiration to me to see human beings. You know, people like Eric, or people even worse than Eric, who actually just managed to actually to go through that and come out the other side. When they come out the other side, they're amazing human beings. They've been through so much, you know, please excuse the term again, dog shit. But their mangoes are just sweeter and juicier than anything I can, I can produce. When you see that beauty in life, you realize that there's a lot of potential, no matter who we are, no matter what we're doing. At the moment, because you know, of COVID, just our greenhouse gas emissions has gone down quite a lot. 
can always see some positive in there. So that's my, that's who I am. I'm just always a positive individual, no matter what happens. I don't see darkness. Okay. Thank you, Arjun, for that positivity. So. Well, you know, you know the reason why. Um, well, what is the best, what if Diana's still there? What's the best blood type? The best blood type is B positive. <laughs> I do apologize. What can you expect from That's me? That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> okay, so someone's asking, when practicing letting go, sometimes it can feel that nothing is important anymore. How to let go and meanwhile be compassionate and caring and be passionate? Well, try letting be instead of letting go. Because what letting go is, letting go of the negativity, letting go of the control, you know, which negativity sort of generates. So, you know, you just, you let go of controlling. And what's left when you stop controlling things and you stop wanting things to be different, you stop looking for something somewhere else, is what's happening right now. It's what you have. You let this moment be. And of course, you're positive to this moment. When you put down those two shopping bags, what's left? It's not negativity, it's a beautiful sense of rest and freedom, and you become alive again. That's a wonderful thing. So that's why letting go, sometimes if that feels a bit too negative for you, just let be. Let this be, let everything else go. That's not negative at all, it's great fun. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One second. Okay. I would like to hear how you would describe real and true. Thank you. Okay. How would you define those two words? Well, I'd, I'd probably just, you know, probably get it wrong. But anyway, what is real is what you're experiencing right now. Truth is how you interpret it and fit it into the whole idea of your perceptual framework of life. How's that? Is that true? I don't know if it's true, but it certainly was real. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay, the next question is, how, uh, please advise how one becomes disenchanted and dispassionate when knowing very well that what's going on is dukkha and impermanent. So I think this person means that from that insight of dukkha and impermanence, how do we then move into the uh, wisdom of Disen dispassion, disenchantment? Can well, I think that's a bad, yeah, but it's also viraga as well. Yeah. And it's a viraga, it's not sort of um, disenchantment, it's things fading away. In other words, when you see things as suffering, you don't keep them. You just, you know, put them in the, the other bins, whatever day of the week they come. And they disappear, they get taken away. So after a while, when you see things are suffering, you sort of move away from them. They disappear, they vanish. So it's a, it's a way that to things which we attach to, which we hold on to, we realize how much suffering they are and we don't need to keep them. And they vanish, they go. Physical things go, it takes a while, but they go. And then emotional problems disappear. When you see how much suffering there, I think, well, why do I have to keep this? The past. Why do you have to keep the past? People say, oh, you learn from the past. You don't learn from the past. You torture yourself from the past. You learn from the present moment. So you just let it go. It's dukkha, the past. And so after a while, it vanishes. Yay, free. The same with the future. Think about the future. I don't know what's going to happen next. And every time I... If you fear about the future, of course that creates a lot of suffering. And if, if I hope for the future, that also creates a different type of suffering. But when I don't have any hopes or fears for the future, that I can be in this moment, I can enjoy my life. And being afraid for the future is like you're reading a really good novel. You can't help but just going a few pages in front to see who did it, what's going to happen next. What a waste of an opportunity to enjoy a good novel that is. So instead you just read this page and see what happens when you get to the next page. 
you don't try and rush to the next page before you've read this page happening now. So after a while, you just live in the present moment. And, and also, this was one of the problems because when I gave that talk some years ago on uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, I forget which one it was, but then the professor, he gave his presentation first. He said that dementia is defined by not being able to remember the past, not being able to think for the future and being socially disengaged. I thought, oh my goodness, I've been teaching the people to be demented ever since I started asking people to be in the present moment and living a simple life. <laughs> 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 Obviously, there's something much different there. Okay. Um, we've only got probably another 15 minutes left, Ajahn. I don't know how is your energy. Are you good oh, for another okay. 15? Yeah, it shouldn't be. <laughs> what do you okay. mean, 15 minutes? That's looking yeah. into the future. <laughs> All right, so I thought we'd do a couple of questions, then we have a little um, talk about the project at some point. So, okay. so you could say something about that, Ajahn. Um, so the next question is about someone who just lost their beloved dog, Spotty, who passed away on Wednesday. Uh, the sense yeah. of loss and guilt is so acute, especially during the times of uncertainty here in the US and facing the potential of increased isolation because of COVID. I'm struggling with knowing how to balance honoring the memories I have with my dog who is with me for so many years, allowing myself to grieve and having faith that one day I'll be able to view things with gratitude, like the simile of the concert. Yeah, it's, our oh, dogs are great. There was, I don't know, there's a couple of stories of dog ghosts. The dogs came back to visit their owners as a ghost. It was a beautiful experience. This is one fellow I should go and give him an email sometime. And um, I actually just practice what I preach. I don't answer emails when I should do. <laughs> but anyway, uh, his neighbor was a builder and his builder had a dog and eventually the dog died. But the following morning after the dog died, so this dog ran into his house. It looked exactly the same as the dog which had died. And that dog went to all of the favorite places in his house where he used to live, uh, where he used to go, you know, coding up in the corner, out in the back there was a leaky tap, we'd always get something to drink. And even went upstairs, they, this was a builder, he was getting up early in the morning and his wife was still in bed, still asleep. And the dog would always go up to her and give her a kiss before he went to work with his owner. And they even uh, kissed this, this wife <laughs> and they went back down and wanted to jump into the, the car to go to work with his boss. But the boss said enough. And so the dog turned around and ran away. And that was a ghost. It wasn't the real dog because the real dog had died. And his poor wife, because she was half asleep, didn't realize she was kissing a dog, kissing a, a ghost, not the real dog. It was a beautiful story because you know, it's, even the dog had this love and care came back into the house one more time before going away for the last time, after it had died. And so with poor old Spotty, he had wonderful experiences there, and you honour it's uh, Spotty's life. And you always ask, you know, Spotty, what would Spotty want for you? And of course, sometimes, I don't know, you probably, you may be able to hear Spotty in the house. Sometimes you feel it, sometimes you can smell it. You know that even dogs, they don't leave you that easily. And just wait for those things to happen. And then, you know, again, you have to let Spotty go. And Spotty will get reborn somewhere. And maybe uh, in another dog. Maybe a dog might run into your house in a few days' time. And you realize, hey, maybe this is someone I've known before. And have another companion for a while. You have to share your life and, and love with. And that is the best way of honoring Spotty. Honoring what the dog taught you and the kindness and love which it showed you. You will always remember that. And it's not such a dark place in the United States yet. There's COVID and there's all sorts of stuff going on there, but it's still a, a very wonderful place to live. So enjoy the beautiful time. Of course, it's now, oh, it's coming up to the, the winter time. It's November now. Look forward to the snows. Cause you know, that's something we don't get in Australia, not where I live anyway. Just, you know, the snow just carpeting the, the trees and the ground. 
you know, I'm just ad libbing here. Maybe you might think it's wasting time, but as soon as I mentioned the snow, I remember this one time when I was in Sussex. I went out in the morning, it was minus 26 degrees centigrade. And I'd rugged up so I couldn't really feel the cold. But it was a case of only mad dogs and Englishmen went out in the winter snow. <laughs> and even the dogs were much wiser, they never went out. And I went out there in the snow and it was just magical. There's no sound of any cows. There's no flights, no sound of aircraft, no birds. Nothing was moving in the forest, only me. When I stopped crunching the snow, everything was just so silent. Nothing moved, nothing made any sound. And I remember that with a sense of awe and magic, the silence of the winter time. It's magical. Sorry, I just, I indulge in that memory because it was just so beautiful. Anyway, what else am I supposed to do? Is there any other question? Yeah, there's actually about three more quite nice questions. I, I wonder Good. if you've got energy for that. Yeah, sure. Yeah? All right. Yeah, sure. So the first one is, I have experienced a lot of unpleasant situations or straight up abuse from caregivers and, and oh, yeah. forward on to partners, etc. I only recently recognized it and it has left me with a very disillusioned view towards people. I wish not to have it, but my worldview becomes daunting and almost cynical. Yeah, well, think of you know, even caregivers. In old days, that caregivers actually could give care rather than fulfilling quotas. And sometimes caregivers tell me that they're just, they've got so many people they have to wash, so many people they have to change and bed and stuff. And just, you know, they get stressed out. And caregivers should be one profession where you have time, time to actually to show care. I, not very often I've been sick, but I remember once going in hospital many, many years ago and being woken up in the middle of the night to actually to take some medication or something. And then just this beautiful nurse just smiling at you. And it was just like an angel visiting. You can really feel the care coming from this being, this person. And that was just such a wonderful experience to have that care. And of course, care is so therapeutic. And it's something which in our societies that uh, caregivers should not be just uh, having a number of people they have to look after and things they have to do. They should be able to give care. Even nurses now, even nurses, they've got to fill out so many forms and you know, complete so many reports that they're just almost like secretaries rather than real caregivers. It would be wonderful if people could volunteer to go to hospitals. Just don't have to need to, any reports, just be able to, to talk to somebody, to hold their hand, and just to, you know, to share a story or to just to spend time just caring for somebody. It's wonderful to be able to do things like that. So you can understand poor caregivers, they are stressed out and they just, they don't give care anymore. They're frustrated, poor things. But then you get abused by them. Poor people are subject to that and take it out to other people. You can see just how if you give care and love, that gets given up to other people. If you give those ill will and just negativity, that just spreads and spreads and spreads. So please, just try and give the care as much as you can. No one's to blame. Just very basically our society and maybe legalities. And sometimes I think, please excuse me, but I hope there's no lawyers here, but sometimes even the legal system makes life so complicated and doesn't trust people. Some people do abuse the system, but it makes it so difficult for everybody. Anyway, next question. Okay. So even though there's the concept of non-self, meaning no identity, can you give a property or adjective to the mind to describe it? The only good example I have is undeveloped mind and developed mind. Yeah, just, just work in progress, mind. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> and also 
the other way is like and uh, never mind <laughs> <laughs> this captures anatta non-self but never mind is when there is not a mind is never mind then is you know you, you don't hold on to things so much Great. Okay. Okay. So I think the last one, which is a big one and a great one, yeah. can Ajahn please give guidance on how to think about the purpose of life? Don't think about the purpose of life. Thinking about the purpose of life, it just gives you headaches. Don't think about the purpose of life. Know the purpose of life. And a long time ago, when I was pressed on this, I said. The purpose of your life is the purpose you give your life. So what are you doing with your life? You make the purpose of your life. It's not something which is there we should discover. It's just how you look at your life and the purpose, the meaning which you give it. Great. Thank you, Ajahn. No worries. So Oh, okay. And uh, the Anakampa Bikuni project. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Please, please look after the Anakampa Bikuni <laughs> project. I do whatever I can, but I've got no money to give and I can't sort of travel over there yet, but I'm sure it'll happen soon. Be able to travel again and visit you all. And in the meantime, just please look after Venerable Chanda because she does get overworked. You know, please, you know, you tell me these things. I know you maybe get embarrassed, but you know, you give too much to people and not enough for yourself. So remember to rest, relax, eat well. And if anyone has any real skills of administration and stuff, that's where she really needs some help. And, but you can't expect her to tell you exactly what to do. You have to sort of take the lead. So if she tells you what to do, it's just she's doing still the same old work. <laughs> and so if you can volunteer for admin work, you don't need to be in Oxford to be able to do that, wherever you are in the world. Sometimes you can do the all the admin stuff or the setting up the talks and setting up the registration and stuff instead of you know, poor Venerable Chanda having to do that all the time because she's a resource. You know, by this age in her life as a nun, you know, she's getting to be quite a, a very good teacher and a good meditator. So you don't want to waste the resource of someone who is kind and is wise and you know, can teach that so they get just burnt out just being on the computer answering emails all the time. So that's one of the reasons why we work to our strengths. And I know that she would still do all that work, but you know, you who support her, make her an offer she can't refuse. <laughs> As I used to say, the Godfather, <laughs> so that she gets that sort of support. You know, it's not so much money support. I mean, you know, you're not asking for any money because I've got enough good disciples and if you need some money I can ask them and they'll, they'll look after you but it's actually that emotional support and actual work support that is just sometimes overbearing so that's the nice thing you can support her with thank you Ajahn <laughs> yeah it's kind of strange when you hear um, your teacher talking about you but um, I'm learning to receive it and yeah. just uh, understand it's really not uh, <laughs> all about non-self, yeah. as you said. Yeah, Never, mind. Never mind. Never mind. But um, the other thing I, I wanted to say, actually, to the people who are interested in ordaining is that um, what we really need, actually, more than anything in the West, is people to be involved from the outset and, and not so much jumping straight into the ordination, but helping to create the conditions, first of all. Yeah. So there's always yeah. a process to go through. First of all, coming to a monastery, spending some time, getting to know the community, obviously getting to know me and seeing, you know, whether you benefit from that experience or not and mm. trying out different places, visiting different monasteries and then, you know, seeing where you can be of service because I think monastic life is something that um, is very special in the sense that your livelihood, your work life, so to speak, is actually all aligned to the Dhamma. So it's all yeah. part of the Eightfold Noble Path. It's not yeah, something it's separate from that. And then you get yeah. the space as well and the solitude, which is probably a lot more than you'd get in normal lay life. Unless you've retired yeah. and you've got a little apartment somewhere and can meditate for the rest of your yeah. life. 
Um, I think but this particular different. path is very integrated. Yeah. Yeah, you, the difference between monastics and the laity is the, the amount of renunciation you've done. Oh, no, I've done. You've given up so much. And because of that renunciation, that gives incredible amount of power in meditation and in teaching. It's one thing actually to say you've given up, but you know, you really have. You, know, you haven't got a place of your own. You haven't got a, a money in the bank or um, a pension fund or something. <laughs> you know, if you left June Street in Oxford, you'd be living under a bridge. So that amount of renunciation, that trust and faith you have in the Dhamma and the system, and that you know you know that you know you would never have to do that because you're cared for. The more you renounce, the more you trust these wonderful ideals of kindness and generosity and service. And it's brilliant to see that in work. I never need to sort of worry about my food place to stay, health, or health insurance. There's so many kind and wonderful people around which I've got to know. And that's what happens in the monasticism. That you, you really touch something so deep, and it's the safest place you can be when you've got nothing, absolutely nothing. So it's beautiful. So it's, ordination is wonderful. Great. So I would like to invite Anne-Marie just briefly to say how you might be able to support us. Um, so she'll just speak for a couple of minutes and then we'll have a few closing words from Ajahn Brahm because I know it's quite late in Perth now. Yeah, so it's gone past 10 o'clock. Yeah, we won't be much longer. Just a couple of minutes so okay. that Anne-Marie can say a couple of words. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Venerable, and thank you so much, Ajahn. And um, it's really nice to see everyone here today from, I think, from all over the world. And Excellent. all ages as well, I think. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to um, offer everyone some different ways of supporting the project, if you would like to. And I've just put something in the chat box as well. Um, just to explain that Venerable is staying in the residence in Oxford at the moment on her own um, because of the corona restrictions. Um, she, she's not able to um, receive any guests, so um, we're trying to support her in different ways. Um, so, for example, um, if you're interested in helping out with um, some of the food shopping um, that Venerable gets delivered, um, that's the way of doing it, or uh, any other requisites. There's also um, a needed items list on the website, which I've also just put in the chat box. Um, and um, I think uh, the other co-hosts and already put the website link in there as well. And so did I, I think, uh, where, with all the um, sort of general information about donations. Um, so yeah, well, for, every, for anybody, by the way, who can't see that, for anybody who's listening to the recording, I'll read out the... Um, the website for donations, it's anukampaproject.org forward slash donate. And if you are interested in offering any um, food shopping support or uh, also if you're for any volunteer support or any queries about ordination, you can email uh, team at anukampaproject.org. And um, <clears throat> sorry, the needed items list you can find on the website on the donations page. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. And I also just want to extend my uh, heartfelt gratitude to, first of all, my co-hosts, who uh, I didn't properly introduce in the beginning just because of the time. We were a little bit late starting. So, but thank you very much to Anne-Marie, who um, was helping with the question and answers by sending me everyone's questions, and to Mel, who was recording the, uh, the session. We tried to live stream, it didn't quite work, but thank you so much, Mel, and um, it's all good. We'll be uploading this onto our YouTube channel afterwards in due course, as soon as we can. And to Derek, who's also uh, on the team, he's come on the team to help uh, co-host these sessions. So all of you have been absolutely fantastic and I don't think we could have really managed it without your support. They'll also be uh, supporting us Ajahn Brahm for your online retreat, which starts a week on mm. Thursday. 
so we have a six day online retreat with Ajahn Brahm and with myself. I'll be doing the evening session and Ajahn Brahm will be talking about the practice of Anapanasati, so meditation mm -hmm. on the breath and how you can take that meditation into the deep states of bliss and stillness. Uh, there's still a few places left on that retreat, maybe about five or six. Sometimes it looks as though we're full and then somebody doesn't complete the process. So we still do have a few places if anyone can take six days off of work or would like to make best use of the time they have. And of course, last thanks to Ajahn Brahm, who has been the most phenomenal Kalyanamitta that I could have wished for. <laughs> He's been my teacher now for about 10 years and uh, seen me through many ups and downs. And it's just wonderful to feel that real unconditional love, which includes a lot of patience. I think patience is one of your um, <laughs> admirable qualities among so many others. Enormous generosity of time. Uh, of spirit, non-self spirit, um, and it's the kind of uh, environment for growth which really is so precious in one's life, you know, because sometimes all we really need are the conducive conditions and the right kind of encouragement and motivation and someone who sees our potential and our inner worth. So thanks to Arjun Ram for being that kind of guide and for being such an incredible example to all of us about you know, just how far this practice can take us. And, um, you know, how you can see that Ajahn Brahm never, never gets negative, really. I don't think you ever get down, Ajahn. Maybe tired, maybe even a bit hungry sometimes. I don't know. But, you know, a mind that can stay even and stay caring and compassionate throughout all these vicissitudes that we face. This is really uh, the potential of the Dhamma. So thank you for embodying that. For all of us to take inspiration from and uh and yes i would like to uh let you go so that you can have some rest and continue okay, teaching so. for a long time to come so, so can we do the three sadhus yes sadhu sadhu sadhu, sadhu. sadhu. <laughs> 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 Yay! 